Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Drift in a native canoe somewhere off the Solomon Islands. Ahead of you lie the unknown terrors of native savagery. And closing in on you is a white man whose gunboat will smash you to the bottom of the sea. Listen now as Escape brings you John Russell's story, The Price of the Head. Possessions of Mr. Christopher Pellet were these. A bad name in the island, the suit of ducks in which he lived and slept, a continuous thirst for liquor, and a set of fine red whiskers. And strangely enough, he had a friend, Karaki. Now, no man can gain friendship except by virtue of some decent quality attaching to him. And Pellet had none. How then explain the loving devotion lavished upon that drunken brute by the gentle native? This was the mystery at Fuputi. But mystery or no, Pellet himself became unendurable to the decent, peaceable folk of the town. Maybe obliged to shoot you. Uh, you shoot me, that'd be murder. Murder's fine talk for company agent, Mr. Mummery. <laughs> Where's that boy? Karaki! Come here, Karaki! Karaki, come quick. Here's shot. You all right? No hit pellet anywhere? <laughs> no, I'm fine, Karaki. Fine. Go fetch one bottle of rum. You come along home, huh? Me go along, Mr. Howe. Pay yeah. for trouble. Catch a bottle. Wait here. Me no be much long. You wait. Fine fellow, that Karaki, eh, Mummery? Only friend I got in this filthy island. May I suggest, Mr. Pellet, that perhaps if you behave... Suggest somewhat... nothing. I got a headache. You tell Karaki I've gone to the beach, huh? Eh? In the Silver Isles, there lived a wench whose eyes were He'll pay for this mess, but next time he blows up, I'll put a bullet in his leg. No, no, Mr. Howe, no shoot. Karaki all time, pay good. Well, Mr. Mummery, beat it, Karaki. I'd like a chat with you, Mr. Howe. Right with you, sir. Boy, Jack, give Karaki a bottle of rum and get this mess cleaned up. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Howe. Come into the office, Mr. Mummery. We're more cozy there. That fellow ought to be in jail. The man's a mad beast. He is, and particularly so on your run, Mr. Howe. Oh, come now, Mr. Mummery. You can't lay Pellet's sins on my doorstep. Nothing I can do, as long as he pays his bills. Well, I'm a fair man, Mr. Howe, and I won't order you to stop selling Pellet your run if there's any other way to handle the matter. Well, to be honest with you, sir, I do make a small profit on Karaki's pearls, what he pays me with. Though nothing enormous, mind you. Still, I'd do without it not to have Pellet about. 
When I walk down the street, I have a feeling the natives are laughing at me just because I'm a white man, too. By heavens, it's true. And something must be done at once. Mm -hmm. Mr. Howe, I'll try talking to him like a gentleman. But I'll be firm with him. Now, if you'll send Moy Jack with a message that I'd like to have him for tea tomorrow... Tea? <laughs> you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Mummery. Tea oh, isn't... Uh... All right, then. Uh, tell him there'll be whiskey. That'll do it, sir. And good luck with him. Thank you, Mr. Howe. Tagara, whiskey for Mr. Pellet, girl. Uh, it's been years since my throat's been wet by good Scotch whiskey, my Marie. Yes, I am sure. And you live well here. Fine house, good liquor, servants. I work hard, Mr. Pellet, and I... Stay sober. You should have been a preacher, Mummery. You missed your line in Copra. No, no, if you please, Mr. Pellet, we are not discussing my career. No, well, go on, Mummery. As long as I'm drinking your whiskey, I'll listen to your chatter. Girl? You... You make it difficult, Mr. Pellet. I mean to. Yes, I suppose you do. I didn't expect you'd invited me here out of friendliness, Mummery. Well, you could have friends, Mr. Pellet, if you live decently. I live the way I want, and I've got a friend. Ah, a savage. That's odd. Never thought a Karaki is a savage. I suppose he is. Yes, civilization lies lightly on these people, Mr. Pellet. At heart, Karaki is nothing but a, a heathen from Bougainville. Bougainville. Yeah, you know, Karaki likes it there. He's always talking about it. Well, you must probably talk about your home. But there is a vast difference, I'm sure. Karaki's quite a serious little man. You just haven't got to know him, that's all. Well, we scarcely find much in common, I fear. Good heavens, Mr. Pellet, surely you haven't sunk so low as to have forgotten everything we stand for out here? I have no use for any man, except Karaki. He's the only friend I ever had. But how do you know what is going on in that head of his? How can you tell? I don't have to. So far, he's treated me right, that's enough. But you have no respect for... for the position the rest of us here must maintain. You disgrace us in the eyes of every native on this island. Well, I'm impressed. I didn't know I was that important a figure, Mummery. Tagara, whatever your name is... Ah, you are beyond reasoning with Mr. Pellet. You can go on trying, Mummery, as long as the whiskey holds out. Huh? Have you no pride, man? I cleaned out a bar in Sydney once, alone, against nine sailors. Oh, that's not exactly... I engineered a mutiny aboard an Arab dhow in the Gulf of Oman some years back. I sold a cargo at Bahrain for pretty figure, Mummery, pretty figure. Well, that's certainly compounding a crime. Ah, that cargo is illegal in the first place, Mummery. Slaves it was. Little boys and girls from India. But, Mr. Pellet, I must ask you once and for all... The bottle's almost finished, Mummery. What do you want? Will you take a job if I offer you one? A job? Mummery, I stopped working nine years ago. I'm against working. All right. Then I must ask you to leave this island on the next boat. I like it here, Mummery, and I'm staying here. Well, I can't make you go, I suppose. You suppose right. But I do have certain powers. The company controls the sale of liquor here, Mr. Pellet. And if I order that none be given you... You'd do that? I would. Unless I take a job or leave, sir. Huh? Exactly. Well, I'm not working and I'm not leaving, Mummery. Then you won't be boozing either, Mr. Pellet. Give me the rest of that bottle, girl. I've earned it. Good day, Mr. Pellet. That night, the order went out to serve Pellet no more rum. However, the alcohol he had taken on at the agent's house saw him through until noon the next day. He awoke then with a terrible thirst, and by evening he was raging. You cannot cut off alcohol from a man who has been continuously drunk for nine years without results more or less violent. Karaki, with the patience of a saint, bore the brunt of it all. Karaki, the little heathen from Bougainville, a place where some people were smoked and others eaten. It took two days of awful torture to break Pellet's spirit. And on the morning of the third, the man was shattered. Feel much better today, no? No, Karaki, it gets worse. Yeah. Karaki pulled boss from ocean last night. 
You want him to fight big fella shark? Drink blood, you say? Move out of my head. Clean out of my head. Two, three weeks. You'll be fine once more, my word. I can't wait two, three weeks. I gotta have a drink, Karaki. I'll die if I don't get a drink. Wait a few days. All fine. You don't understand, Karaki. I can't make it. You... Don't tell Mummy I can't make it. Tell him I'll leave on the next ship. No, no. No, no, can't leave. We plenty much all the time good friends, Karaki and Pallet. Yeah, I know, I know, but I, I, I'm no good dead, Karaki. You go tell him now. No, no, can't leave. Wait. You tell him or I'll tell him, Karaki, but I'll have a bottle if I have to kill together. Not now. Sleep for a long, long couple hours. Then go, maybe. No, now. No. I'd go myself. No, no, please. Karaki, please. let go of me. Go on, smash her. I'll have my rum and no man will stop me. No, can leave. Not now. Not now. Or anywhere else in Fufu. Give me a drink, man. I'll, I'll get on your blasted ship. Oh. Well, then you agree to leave. Yeah, yeah. And on the next ship? Yes, on the next ship. <laughs> you can have your rum. Yeah. But you'll be on that ship when she sails. I'll be on it. Give me a drink, man. Quick. So you can get a drink at Mr. Howe's. I'll send a message to him. Oh, Mummery was all I could do to get this far. I need a drink now. You're all right, Mr. Pellet. But just one. I will not have you disgracing me in my own house. Yeah? Take it. One more. No. Give me that bottle. Mm. Now, Mummer, if you, you come to Michael Howes with me, I'll buy you a drink. No, thank you, Mr. Pellet. I'd rather not be seen in your company. Write a note to Howe. Tell him to sell me rum. I'll take it with me. Do you have to get drunk now, Mr. Pellet? Now. You back out of this and I'll kill you, Mummery. Now. All right, Mr. Pellet. But it will be a happy day for all of us when you're aboard that ship. I'll find me another island, Mummery. Maybe you'll be transferred there one day. God forbid. I'll write you your note. And I want to see no more of you till the day you leave. That's good enough for me. You're dull company, Mummery. At least I'm a gentleman, Mr. Pellet. And I have enough respect for myself not to become a walking insult to me and my race. The note, Mummery, the note. You can come to Howes and preach to me. I don't mind it there. Hurry, man. Hurry. Hurry. You are listening to The Price of the Head, tonight's presentation of Escape. Sometimes it's fun to escape with an adventure story, as you're doing now. At other times, it's fun to relax with music. Tomorrow on CBS Radio, you can enjoy the second in our series of Helsinki's Festivals. The program will open with the Sibelius Symphony No. 5 in E-flat major and continue with four more of his most impressive works. Enjoy easy listening on World Music Festivals tomorrow over most of these stations. And now back to Escape and the second act of The Price of the Head. days that followed, Pellet became a sodden lump of flesh preserved in alcohol. He did not smile, nor dance, nor exhibit any of the amiable eccentricities that sometimes recommend the drunken to a certain toleration. He was a brute, and he behaved like a brute. But all the time, waiting for the day the ship would arrive, Karaki remained true and showered more devotion than ever upon his friends. He spent his evenings outside Michael Howe's bar, patiently waiting for Pellet to get drunk enough to take along home. Night after night, Karaki waited, while the white man stood roaring inside. Boy, Jack, bring me another bottle. Uh, please, Mr. Pellet, close up now. You plenty too much drunk already. Well, don't tell me when to drink. I'll go get that bottle. Jump. Oh, all right, Mr. Pellet. All right, I get bottle. I fix your bottle. And hurry it up, you bald clown. 
Who told you to open it? Just, just come, I'll open the bottle. If you want a broken head, more, Jack. Where's Hal? Uh, Mr. Hal gone home. Pretty good rum, yes, Mr. Pellet? Oh, it stinks. So do you. So does everyone on this bloody island. No like rum? Here's what I think of your rum. <laughs> now come here, Moy Jack. Because I'm going to crack your head. I'm going to crack your head. Karaki! Karaki! Take him long home now, Karaki. A few minutes later, the wiry little Karaki had the white man across his shoulder and bore him down the beach to the miserable shelter of pandana sleeves they called home. There he eased pellets to a mat, bathed him with cool water, and carefully brushed the dirt from his bright red hair and whiskers. Then he sat by with a fan and kept the mosquitoes from the drunkard's bloated face. He sat there all night while Pellet slept. It was midday before Pellet awoke and groaned his way out of a painful fog of alcohol. Rum. Rum, Crocky. Rum. Coconut more better. Here. Drink milk. Feel fine soon. You'll find sooner if I had some rum, Karaki. Haven't you got a bottle around here, son? No rum. You drink long too much rum last night. <laughs> too much Moy Jack rum. Huh? What do you mean, too much Moy Jack rum? Moy Jack put white powder in bottle. Make me sleep. White powder? So that's... What a little rat. Moy Jack him all the time laugh. I'll tear his throat out. You be careful. Moy Jack him all the time carry knife. Cut face all up. Oh, a little wax man. I'll, I'll murder him. Come on, Karaki. So you watch out for knife and Moy Jack him playing fast. I'll kill him. Watch him, fella, close. Pellet no get face cut. I'll handle him, Karaki. Don't you worry. Half in anger and half in anticipation of the pleasure of beating a man, Pellet staggered down the beach towards Howe's bar. It was the noon hour of repose and all Fufuputi was asleep. Pellet reached the bar and found Moy Jack dozing peacefully among the bottles. He woke him with a savage kick. Get up, you dirty scum! Get up so that I can bust holes in you. No, hurt me, Mr. Pellet. Let go! Leave me on the table, will you? Not again, you won't. Now, I cut you. Cut you, Mr. Pellet! Well, you know, you'll have to fix me a knife, too. Oh. Come on, boy. I want to twist this bottle around in your face. Hold him. Hold him. I'll learn you to fight with a red-headed man. I'll learn you... Dead. I killed him. I killed him, like I said, Karaki. Uh, yes, dead. Mm, plenty of trouble now. Police. Yeah. Come on, let's get out of here. Where we go, Karaki? We gotta hide someplace. You go long house on beach. Wait there. Me fix them boat. Leave Pufuti quick. What boat? You got no boat. Uh, me find a boat. Me hide. Tell a friend, pellet. All right. I trust you, but. But hurry, man. Hurry. Pellet waited in terror in the shack on the beach while Karaki broke into the boat sheds and with an axe smashed the bottoms out of the three craft sheltered there. Then he opened the trade room and quickly gathered together a bundle of supplies, including a rifle and a box of cartridges. Next, he carried everything out onto the beach and loaded it into a stout outrigger canoe that belonged to Mr. Mummery. Finally, he fetched pellets from the shack, and together they hurriedly launched the canoe in the lagoon. Karaki rigged the big mat sail and then paddled out into the breeze just beyond the harbor entrance. 
We made it, Karaki. We're safe. Yes. Hey, look, where are we headed for, anyway? What island we go, Karaki? Bougainville. Bougainville? You crazy? That's 800 miles from here. All the same, we go a long way home. 800 miles? We go. All fine. Always one bring you along my home. All right, Karaki. I don't know why you're doing it for me, but I'll see you through. It was not the beginning of a very pleasant voyage from Mr. Christopher Pennett. The fear of being captured and hanged was great enough, but added to it were the horrors brought on once more by the lack of alcohol. The first night he was too seasick to care. But by morning, he was raving. Rum. Give me rum, you blasted heathen. No, got him rum. You bloody fool, why didn't you pack in some rum? Need water. No need rum. Got plenty water. Curse you, Karaki, I don't drink water. Better you drink water. Well, I won't. Turn back. I'll take hanging to this turn back, I tell you. Oh, uh, soon catch him. One big fella wind. Blow straight to Bougainville. No. How could you find Bougainville anyway? No. We're going back, I tell you. Karaki easily tied the weakened white man hand and foot and continued to sail off into the open sea. Now and then, he threw a dipper full of seawater over the white man and occasionally fed him with coconut milk. Karaki was an excellent nurse. He even combed Pellet's red hair and whiskers twice every day. By the time they reached the Santa Cruz region, Pellet's condition had improved and Karaki released him. They were now in an area peppered with tiny islets, and Karaki decided to land on the lee of one in order to replenish their water supply. He had dropped sail and was paddling slowly into the beach when suddenly, from out of nowhere, a cutter carrying two white men appeared behind them. No catching Karaki and Bennett! Go away! Put the gun down, Karaki. We're in enough trouble now. Okay, I shoot! reason the two white men did not believe a native would dare resist them. And for their mistake, they were both killed. Karaki, however, wasted no time sailing back into the open sea without his precious water. And 29 days later, he was doling out the few remaining drops to Pellet, taking none for himself. His every gesture was one of sacrifice that his white companion might survive. Finally, on the 36th day, they sighted Choiseul, and by noon they came ashore. There they stayed for a week, fattening themselves on the unlimited supply of coconut. So you think Bougainville is just under the horizon, eh, Karaki? Yes. Mighty good thing, too. You know, this is the limit of British authority, my boy. Big fella British master, stop him here. No can go that side, eh? Yes. No can punish Karaki for anything he do of Bougainville's side. My word. No catch pellet. Never. What makes you so sure of that? Uh, me savvy. <laughs> well, all right, old chap. You got me this far. I trust you. You know you fight a fellow, Karaki? Yes. Sure don't talk much, though. No? I haven't. Maybe Mummery was right. I'd sure like to know what goes on under that top knot of yours, my boy. I'd like to tell you how grateful I am. Wish I could show you. Now listen, Karaki. Uh, me one big fella friend, long you, Savvy. You one big fella friend, long me, Savvy. Me two big fella friend always. What? Yes, my word. <laughs> oh, Karaki, you kill me. <laughs> And thus did Christopher Pellet express his gratitude to the quiet savage who had with rarest self-sacrifice saved his life 
again and again. And now that he was thoroughly sober, he could understand it no more than Mummery had back in Fufuti. Two days later, under a beautiful dawn, they sailed into Bougainville into a bay that was crystal blue and right up onto a dazzling white beach. Pellet was the first to shore and he ran up to a rocky point to see all the charm of the place for himself. Karaki, in his simple and efficient way, proceeded about his own affairs. He landed what was left of the supplies stolen at Fufuti. A few minutes after, Pellet heard a gentle footstep behind him and turned to find Karaki standing there with the rifle at his hip and the axe in his hand. Me like. Me like, too. Great place you've got here, Karaki. Me like him head. Huh? What? Oh, <laughs> me like him you, too, Karaki. We big fella friend, right? Me like him too much. One fella head belong along you. What do you mean? I don't understand. Red hair. Fine red whiskers. Big prize here. Smoke him head. Make him Karaki, big man on island. You mean... You mean you got... My head? Fine head. Very fine head. Cut him off now. <laughs> that was the way of it. That was all the mystery. In Karaki's country, a white man's head, well smoked, was indeed a prize. But that of Mr. Christopher Pellet, with his precious red whiskers, was a thing to be desired above the love of women. And the simple, patient, enduring Karaki had served hard to win it. And did it really matter to Pellet how or why he died, since his own race would have hanged him for murder anyway? Escape, produced and directed by David Friedkin and Morton Prine, has brought you The Price of the Head, a story by John Russell and adapted for radio by John Meston. Featured in the cast were Mary Jane Croft, Hans Conried, Ben Wright, and Jack Crucian. Also heard were Clayton Post and Herb Butterfield. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stephen. Next week... There's a fortune in the cabin of an airplane crashed on an island somewhere in the Caribbean. And only you know where it is. By your side, sailing the treacherous channels, a smiling killer with a knife from whom there is no escape. So listen next week when Escape brings you E. Jack Newman's story, The Coward. on Melody Ranch tomorrow on CBS Radio when the popular galloping cowboy with the golden voice returns. He's Gene Autry, as singing a saddled man as ever rode the range. Meet Gene Autry at the Old Corral when he returns to Melody Ranch tomorrow on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Night Watch, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Where there's gun smoke, there's Western Adventure, Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network.